Hi, I'm Sharon, and I'm going to be studying the Bible with you for the next few minutes. I live in the Plymouth, New Hampshire area, and I am a retired second grade teacher. My family and I have been attending the Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church for many years. I am now sitting in the sanctuary. <coughs> Before we begin, let's bow and ask God's blessing on our study. Dear Heavenly Father, please come close to us today as we study your word. Give us a clear understanding of the message being taught. May your Holy Spirit fill our minds and hearts and draw us closer to you as we learn of your love and care for each and every one of us. The Gospel of Jesus Christ is good news, not good advice. The difference between news and advice is that news proclaims the past and advice, good advice at any rate, helps guide us in the future to a good outcome. News declares what has been done and advice says what should be or must be done. Every religion, philosophy, and psychotherapy system known to humanity offers moral or behavioral advice for self-improvement self-help, and self-healing. There are a lot of people that are sincere on and honest looking for help and answers in these systems. But the systems themselves all center on what the mor morally broken human being must do, ought to do, or had better do to fix themselves. All of them are fundamentally orientated toward self as the solution. The same principle applies to sales. Buy my product or service and your life will be better. All that is, except for one, the gospel or good news of Jesus Christ. Let's read together 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, where Paul lays out the basic content of the gospel. If you turn in your own Bibles, you will find 1 Corinthians right after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then you'll find 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> Let's read it together. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the Gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this Gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, <clears throat> that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So, boiling it all down, putting it in the proverbial nutshell, Paul says that the gospel saves, that Christ died for our sins, and that he was resurrected in accordance with scriptures. In other words, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The gospel of Christ by which we are saved is a radically different kind of message, solution, and remedy compared to anything else humans have ever come up with. It turns the human attention outward, away from ourselves, and glues our focus on a Savior who gives unconditional love, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Christ gives all of this to us as part of his relationship with us, and when we have a relationship with him, we can experience deep and lasting transformation from the inside out. That's deep. Let's go through it again. With the gospel, we look outside ourselves to change. Christ enters our lives, and it is through our relationship with him that transformation in us takes place. And here is the thing. Everything necessary for us to claim salvation and enter into a relationship with Christ has already been done. That's what Paul is saying in Titus 3, 3 to 8, and that is why the gospel is good news, because it is already in place. Let's read Titus 3, 3 to 8 now. And Titus is located right 
after, not very far after the text that we just read. So Titus 3, 3 through 8. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us gener generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. According to his mercy, he saved us. It's already been done. According to the gospel, the entire plan of salvation is accomplished has been past tense accomplished. It's a historical reality achieved through Christ. He became a human being. Then, within the limits and weakness of our very same human nature, he lived a perfect life of selfless love, died for our sin in our place, rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven to the victory position at the right hand of the Father. Ephesians chapter 2 explains all this quite well. Turn with me there, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read the first 10 verses of this chapter. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourself, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Christ did all of this in our human nature, thus forging out a new humanity on our behalf, as we are told in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22. Let's turn back to that text. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as Adam, in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is why Paul in 1 Timothy 4.10 describes the accomplishments of Christ's life in universal terms that encompass humanity as a whole. As a whole. So turning over to 1 Timothy 4.10. And for this we labor and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, 
and especially of those who believe. In Paul's thinking, the perfect life of Jesus was lived as a representative life for all human beings. The resurrection and ascension of Christ was a representative resurrection and ascension for all human beings. Let's hear it from Paul himself in Galatians 2.20. We need to turn back to Galatians. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is one of my favorite verses and yet one that convicts me of my selfishness. Paul makes a number of points on this subject in his writings. You may want to grab a pencil and some paper and write down two more texts to look up for further study. The first one is Romans 3, 23 and 24. In Romans chapter 3, 23 and 24, Paul speaks of redemption as an achieved reality in Christ. This redemption can be an experienced reality in us. Paul also calls Christians to a life of good works, but points out in Ephesians 2.10, which is the other text for you to jot down, that the good works that God had in mind for us are already done in Christ. Let's go now to 2 Corinthians 5.14. So let's go back there for a minute. Back to 2 Corinthians 5.14. For Christ, Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. I have a note there in my Bible that says, Selfless love calls for the same in return. But for the purpose of this study, we want to point to the fact that Paul says in the death of Jesus, all people were represented. In his death, Jesus suffered with the guilt of the whole human race. As our substitute, he died for us, as us, in our place. Jesus died, rose from the grave, has ascended to heaven, And he's there as our representative. All of this, according to Paul, is the gospel, the historic objective achievements of Jesus. Christ in our very humanity constitutes the good news of what God has done for the entire human race, apart from anything we have ever done to earn or deserve it, purely because of his great love with which he loved us. From the solid foundation of the past tense historic accomplishments of Christ, Paul builds a natural bridge that relates his life with our own. The redemption in Christ is to become the redemption in our hearts and lives. And faith is the means by which we can grab hold of the redemption that exists in Christ. When humans believe the gospel, they don't make up any new facts. Faith does not make facts but rather believes in, relies upon, and identifies with the facts that are already true in Christ. Paul explains how truly powerful God's love is, and he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 through 19, of the transformative effects it has over those who come under its influences. In part of this text we already read, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. 
All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Now, this is a very powerful pa passage. There's a lot in there, and it's worth some continued attention. Perhaps you'll want to pause this study to review the text and answer these four questions. First, what does Paul say is the compelling motivational power of the gospel? Second, once we understand that Christ died for all humans, how will we begin to see people and how will we cease regarding them? Third, what is God's position toward the world and how does he handle our trespasses and our sins? Finally, how many aspects of our individual lives are made new as we become reconciled to God in response to his reconciled position toward us? Essentially, what Paul is telling us is that the love of Christ has a deeply transformative power over all areas of our lives. Moved by his love for us, we cease living for ourselves and begin living for him. And we stop relating to other humans according to the flesh or from our own natural self-centeredness. Rather, we begin seeing others in the light of the fact that Jesus died for them and we relate to them according to their potential as people dearly loved by the God of the universe. As the first man, Adam was the representative head of the human race. Through Adam, humanity was plunged into sin, guilt, and death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul explains that Jesus came to our world to be, as it were, the last Adam, the second man, the heavenly man. He came to redeem Adam's failure. For since by man, Adam, came death, by man, Jesus, also came the resurrection of the dead. Paul makes the comparison and a contrast between Adam and Christ as two representatives of two distinct human experiences. The first man, Adam, was the source of humanity's fall. The second man, Christ, is the source of humanity's redemption. Each of us is free to identify with the second Adam. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 to 22, and verses 44 to 49, as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. In other words, those who identify with Christ will be restored to his image. What an incredible promise. We need not wait for some future event for God to begin restoring his image in us. God wants to transform us from the inside out in that transformation can begin today. You have just completed Bible Study 10. If you found this an interesting study, you can find more resources on this topic by clicking on the additional resources button below. You will find even more in-depth studies. You will find archived sermon videos as well as other instructive videos as we add them. Or, if you prefer, you could simply talk with our pastor, Cliff Gleason. Pastor Gleason wants to be your spiritual resource, and he does answer both his phone and email. So feel free to contact him with any of your questions or comments. Pastor Gleason's phone and email are at the top of this page. And if you look on the main page here, you will see a button you can click on to sign up for notifications. And what that means is that you give us your email address. We won't share it, and we'll only use it once or twice a month to tell you what other sermon topics are at Laconia Church, or what special things are going on at the church. May God bless you as you continue on.
to the next study. May you continue to connect with Christ.